So I'm very fortunate to have married into my in-laws family with Mary Kate. And Mary Kate was born with some pretty severe developmental disabilities and uh, mental delays. And uh, she is an absolute master of one-liners. And she always says exactly what everybody in the room is thinking um, and kind of calls it out. And it's usually pretty funny. So, but by far and away, my favorite one-liner from Mary Kate came when we were at my brother and sister-in-law's wedding rehearsal weekend. Uh, they rented out uh, uh, a yeah, camp up in northern New Hampshire in the mountains. It's beautiful. So Mary Kate is there, and she loves soda. So she had scored herself a, a can of soda, and because of her physical delay, she walks in a way that I would call kind of bouncy. So she sits down next to our friend, and she's all proud to have this can of soda. You can see where this is going. She opens it up, and the soda can explodes all over. She turns to our friend next to her, and she says, her friend Andrea, and she says, what should I do? Should I panic? <laughs> <laughs> what should I do? Should I panic? It's become kind of this famous story in my family now. Now, Mary Kate's story is helpful for us because it draws our attention to what I like to call a space of freedom. And uh, this is often a very fleeting moment, this space of freedom. And the space of freedom is that brief moment when something sets us off. And I actually like that, Chris, you talked about the example of uh, driving into the office and there's somebody there that I know I'm gonna see. I've actually used that exact example before of, and I started having a conversation in my head where I'm right, he or she is wrong, and then as soon as I see that person, I actually create the conditions for causing a fight, right? Um, I bring that into it. So I, I have not taken advantage of a space of freedom where I could choose how I want to respond to this person in that particular situation. Instead, I've let that train of thought decide for me how I'm going to respond. So Mary Kate's story is cool because it shows us when she turned to Andrea and says, what should I do, should I panic? She's pointing out to us that there's that moment between it being set off and how we choose to respond, or don't choose as the case may be. Um, now most of the time, we probably just kind of blow right over that moment, don't even realize it happens. And then we blame people for our own choices and behaviors. So um, what I wanna do is figure out some some ways uh, based on some of the work that I've done and some practical tips like Chris gave you as well, they're actually gonna align pretty well, uh, for how you can start noticing that, that space of freedom and then live out of that space of freedom. That's what I mean by live-centered or living-centered. So there's a famous quote that is um, often attributed to Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor and a uh, Holocaust survivor who also uh, went on to become a very well-known psychologist. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. It's a good, good classic, it's short, if you're looking for a good one. And uh, the quote is this, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies your freedom. So between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space lies your freedom. Now, unfortunately, Victor Frankl didn't actually say it, but that's okay. We're still gonna use it, we're still gonna go with it. I came across this in some research I was doing um, that, that somebody tried to find where he said it and they could never find it. So, but, it's, but it still, I think, captures an essential truth. So, living centered is about dwelling in that space of freedom that I talked about, or that uh, this quote talks about, between stimulus and response. It's that moment where Mary Kate turned and said, what should I do, should I panic? And if you ever have the time to ask that question, <laughs> let me, here's my first free tip. The answer is no, <laughs> unless you're being chased by a tiger or the building's on fire, right? Uh, now our brains, unfortunately, uh, are trained in such a way, and I'm gonna talk about this later, that we, get, we tend to get triggered really quick and we don't even know it. So how can we bring a little freedom into those spaces? So um, when I talk about living, living centered in this way, um, I'm talking about uh, cutting down or reducing firefighting uh, so you can feel confident making wise and ethical decisions that are aligned with both personal values and corporate mission and values. Um, now I use wise and ethical 
intentionally because if I just talk about ethics, you're going to think that I'm, you know, boring professor, and I can be, uh, and ask my students. But uh, uh, wisdom is something that I think is more fundamental. We're going to make ethics. We tend to think about legal compliance or, uh, you know, doing, you know, sexual harassment training. All of that stuff is important. But I want to talk about accessing your inner core of wisdom that everybody has. So you can make good decisions and make it easier to make those good decisions. With a bigger goal that I have in mind also is that this will help you and your business and your community to thrive together. So there's different kinds of alignment that I'm going for. So now why does this matter for running a business? You might say, oh, this is great for mental health or whatever the case might be. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the, the story of the now former CEO of Volkswagen, I won't use his name, um, who it was discovered in 2015. Um, now this CEO and his team of Volkswagen C-suite executives, they had good data. They knew that what was coming down the pike was new emissions regulations from the EPA in the United States under the Obama administration. Now, that CEO and his team had to make a decision. We have data about a change in the market. How are we going to adapt? So one thing they could have done would be to get out ahead of those changes and design a car that was more efficient and had lower emissions. Um, and they could have probably marketed that as like green and all that kind of fun stuff too and, and made more money. What they decided, if you know this story, is to actually create a device and install it into all their vehicles in the US market that would allow them to cheat on emissions exams. And this was publicly discovered in September of 2015. That's why this person is a former CEO. Uh, by one econo economic estimate that I saw, this cost Volkswagen $16.9 billion in market share. $16.9 billion from one bad decision. The other thing I love about this story is it shows why, you know, we love data and there's that line, right? Uh, Trust in God and for everything else there's data. Um, and <laughs> data is important, but it alone is not enough. Decision making is a human process and there are all kinds of factors involved. And some of which Chris talked about, emotions, how you're dealing with that. So, um, now most of you aren't gonna run a company that maybe even generates $16.9 billion. If you do, um, let's talk afterwards. Um, but, uh, and you're probably not gonna be faced with decisions that are quite that large. So let's take this to a smaller scale that might be more applicable. You've probably heard that line, um, that people don't leave jobs, they leave what? People, right, or specifically, bosses or managers. So it's usually not the job description that's the problem, right? It's the, con it's the person that is, you know, making their life crazy that people choose to leave. So if you think about your role as a leader, now we're talking about business here today, but I think this applies to any leadership, coaching, parenting, whatever the case may be. Think of the trust that you have with the people you're working with, kind of like a bank account. And every decision that you make is either making a deposit in that trust bank account or a withdrawal. Um, now, we probably don't think about it this intentionally. Which, that's my point, to get you to think about it a little bit. Now, think about this. In business, your employees and your customers or your clients are constantly monitoring that bank account. Or I'm a parent, so my kids are constantly watching that bank account. Um, whatever your spouse, your partner. Um, but the thing is, they might not be monitoring it in a directly kind of rational, intentional way. They're going to feel that sometimes before they maybe rationally uh, give you any kind of feedback. So you're constantly, if that bank account of trust gets too low and that is determined by the decisions that you make and whether or not those are done in a way that your employees and your customers are seen as being done with integrity, alignment with mission and values, um, and consistently and fairly. Unfairness, I think, is one you hear a lot with people leaving jobs. 
Um, if you're doing that, then you're building up that capital. Um, but if that account gets too low, you're going to start to see that in um, employee turnover, uh, which we know costs people money, um, loss of customers, or even loss of brand reputation. So that economist that talked about Volkswagen, 16.9 billion, that was his estimate, but he kind of footnoted and said, it's hard to know because how do you measure loss of brand reputation? How do we measure the person who might have wanted to buy a Volkswagen, but was like, oh, uh, you know, I don't know. So um, think of that like that, that bank account. So one bad decision alone is not going to tank a company or cause somebody to leave, right? We make mistakes. We're human. We can even ask for forgiveness. Um, if you've ever had a, a boss or a leader who owns their mistakes and asks you to be merciful, that's really powerful. Um, that, that takes them out of that idealizing that you were talking about and humanizes and actually builds trust. We don't need people to be perfect. We need people to have integrity. So that one bad decision won't tank a company, but getting caught up in a process of firefighting that I'll talk about in a second can lead us to unconsciously perpetuate a culture within a business or within a family that um, undercuts instead of supports good decisions. So it affects not just you as the leader, it starts to affect everybody in your culture that you're connected with. So let's break this down a little bit. Um, here's kind of the firefighting scenario. Now, depending on the size of your company that you're working with, if you're a solo entrepreneur, uh, it's just you here. Um, but if you're part of a larger team, um, right? So if Chris told us before, when he's angry, he's going to pass some problems or challenges off to, to Mark <laughs> and let him be nicer about it or whatever. Uh, he'll be the fixer. So depending on, on your team, it might there might be more or fewer people involved. But every morning, you know, we wake up and there's a list of things that need to be done and, and problems and opportunities that need to be dealt with. And we have to make a decision. So we can make a decision. Uh, on the one hand, we can say it's not important yet and kind of push it off to the side, right? This is triage. Now, the other option is that you say it is important now and you either push it to a team or other person in the organization, or maybe you're part of that team, but you bring it to that team. And if they're not centered, and you've created this, this culture that isn't supporting good decisions, then you're going to end up with badly solved problems. Either one, the infinite de delay or badly solved problems, go into what I like to call the bad decision vortex. Um, <laughs> this is where bad decisions go out behind the schoolyard to smoke cigarettes and you know, break into their parents' liquor cabinet, and then drive the car, and you know, all the, actually, a buddy of mine did that in high school, and got a flat tire, and <laughs> that's another story. So what happens now is you've created this invisible queue or line of problems that are just waiting to recur. And guess what? You know exactly where they're going. They come right back around. Now you are literally, that, that's what a culture of firefighting and getting stuck and not solving problems looks like. So you're going to feel a lot like this kid, hand, hand over the face at the end of the day. Actually, you're going to feel like that probably all the time. And, some, and we've probably all felt this way at different times. So uh, it's not, again, the, the goal here is not to be perfect, but how can we make those adjustments and try new things that are going to help? All right, let's look at what I would call a centered or aligned organization, where the culture supports people staying centered, making wise and ethical decisions. So the scenario is the same, but the outcome is going to be different. You have people who are um, they're in tune with their own personal sense of mission and values. Um, hopefully, if it's a good fit and you've hired well, they're also in tune and bought in to your corporate mission and values, and they feel like those are congruent. Um, that might be another reason why people leave jobs, is if they feel that that's not congruent. In an ideal world, uh, the output then that was missing from the firefighting cycle is that you're delivering goods or services to your clients by making good decisions and it's flowing. So what's the positive outcome of that? Well, your clients or your customers, they're gonna be happy and satisfied. They're more likely to return and come back for more business and they're more likely to make referrals, um, whether or not you ask for it or not, right? They might. Um, go online and write something, or they're just going to talk 
to their buddy and say, you know, I got a really great rate on insurance from, from Chris, so go talk to him. Um, likewise, for your company, that's obviously going to support a healthy bottom line. Um, when you are consistently delivering a product and building up that trust bank account, uh, you're going to be building growth. You're going to be able to get out ahead and innovate, right? Like Volkswagen decided not to do, um, knowing that a new regulatory environment was coming. Um, and possibly then also create new services or new products that are going to allow you to keep growing. Obviously, we all want that. Um, but let's think about this in terms of the employees, right? Employee engagement and retention. I've seen some interesting statistics. I should have written them down because I don't like making them up. So I won't give a number, but let's say 70%. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but the numbers about employee engagement when they're surveyed are shocking um, and how disengaged employees are. So if you have this kind of centered culture, um, they're going to feel more valued because they're involved in the process. They're, they're able, they're empowered to make decisions on their own, more engaged, more productive, and more loyal. Right? So you can reduce turnover, reduce costs associated with that. Um, and then last but not least, uh, instead of the hand slap over your face, you're going to be like these kids, right? celebrating your wins. So that's the goal um, with a centered organization. All right. So I've kind of shown you a problem, and I've shown you what the solution looks like. But I want to get practical here and talk about, so what, how do you get more centered? Um, and it starts kind of with you. And then there's, I think, interesting questions that can come out of that about how you create a more centered culture or organization. I'll kind of focus more on at the individual level. So uh, I love this, this picture. So let's look inside your head and your brain. Now, this is where it's funny, because some of the stuff that Chris was talking about, about the brain, um, you talked about it weighing three pounds. The other thing that I find really cool um, about the brain is that if you took all the neurons that are connected in just your brain and you lined them up, it would go to the moon and back, I think several times. And that's within every single skull in this room. That's how many neural connections you have going on inside of your brain. So when you get into that bad decision-making vortex that I talked about before, or the firefighting process, the primary um, enemy number one that you're dealing with in firefighting, or when you're caught up in that stress cycle, is a little part of your brain called the amygdala. It's about the size of a walnut. Um, and that amygdala's job is to trigger the fight or flight response. Some of you probably might remember that. They now, I guess scientists or psychologists now add fight, flight, or faint. Freeze. Freeze, freeze. Yeah, that's freeze or faint. Yeah. Um, and I've actually, uh, when you were talking before about getting jumped and that you never hit the ground, um, I've actually put so much pressure on myself and triggered that amygdala that I fainted giving a, a presentation in graduate school <laughs> in front of my students and the woman who eventually became my dissertation advisor. Um, but you know what? I did hit the ground. I learned from it, like you talked about, right? I found ways. Like, that's why it's become important for me to get and live centered. Um, because I know I can literally make myself sick if I don't learn some better ways to live and work. And my wife and kids need me. And like me better when I'm more centered. Um, at least I think. <laughs> Hopefully they're better off. Okay, so your amygdala triggers that fight or flight response. It triggers a bunch of hormones. Now I should also note this triggering happens at a speed more quickly than your rational mind can process. That's why you don't notice that space of freedom. Because all of this happens before you're even capable of tuning in. Unless you learn some skills to do so, which we'll talk about. So the amygdala sets off a hormonal response of cortisol. Now, how many of you have heard of cortisol before? It's called the stress hormone, right? It increases inflammation. It, it's what is giving me cotton mouth right now when I, talk, when I speak publicly. Uh, it increases your heart rate. It literally narrows your vision. Um, and chronically high rates of cortisol have been um, connected to heart disease and cancer in some, in some studies. So um, we're kind of addicted to this in our culture. Even, you know, Chris was talking before about the phones that we're addicted to. Um, see what's going on, right? You're triggering that cortisol. So 
Um, the, the challenge here is when you're triggered like that, you're not going to see that space of freedom. You literally narrow your vision. And I mean this both literally in terms of your pupils getting smaller, but I also mean that in terms of you as a business leader, right? Vision, we always talk about, is like the most important thing. What's your vision? What's that big goal, right? So when you're constantly firefighting and triggered like that, you can't even see that anymore because you're so narrowly focused and you're more likely to make a decision that is gonna derail you from your, what is it, your C column or your A plus column that, that Chris talked about. So because of my interest in, in these things, um, a few years ago, I guess it's been six or seven years ago, I had this crazy idea that I wanted to create an assessment that would give people feedback about how they're responding to these kinds of triggers so that it could be a tool of self-awareness so that you could say, oh, I can start to learn when I'm getting triggered and then learn some skills and some tools for getting back into that space of freedom and living more centered. And um, I call this now, after some research and some years of working with it, the Centering for Wisdom Assessment. So uh, the, the tool itself consists of 27 questions, and each question asks you on a one to five scale of how strongly you tend to react to different things or persons or scenarios that you might encounter in daily life. And then, once you do that, it graphs your responses into these four categories of awareness. I don't know if you all can see this in the back. Um, I'll real quickly go over this. Um, one, if you look at the, uh, the Y axis going up and down here, I call this your desiring mind. It's more of the emotional kind of immediate response. So your desire can be expressed in one of two ways. You can get attached to something, like I like this, I want it, I want more of it, or you can try to avoid something. So that's, I don't like this, I wanna to try to avoid it, it's a painful situation. I don't want to talk to that person I've been arguing with in my head on my drive in, right? So you avoid that person, you see him coming down the hall and you duck the other way. Um, not good for problem solving in your organization, right? Um, and then, uh, so that's the, that's the Y axis. Then you can think about the X axis as what I call judging mind. And um, judging, again, is just that ability to discriminate between things. And when you're just noting differences, that's great. That's what our brains are a reason is for. But once you start judging um, yourself in relation to others as either better than others, which I call the pride side, or worse than others, the shame side, you're no longer just making distinctions. You're, you're, you're imposing a layer of interpretation on that that's clouding your vision and your judgment. So any time that you see um, higher scores, uh, tends to indicate those are areas where you're more regularly likely to get hooked or triggered and therefore more likely to miss that space of freedom and make a poor decision. Lower scores would indicate being more centered. That, oh yeah, that, like, that doesn't bother me. Um, if, if somebody puts out a bowl of chocolate, um, I'm going to go up on the attachment mind. Like I want to satisfy that urge right away. That's a mundane example. Um, so it's a tool for self-awareness. Um, I teamed up with uh, a former colleague at my previous job who's a psychologist who knows stats and data that I don't. Um, uh, so her name was Dr. Tanya Bach. She's a psychologist at the University of St. Thomas. Um, we did a long study on the assessment tool, a validation study, to see like if it was actually doing what we wanted it to do. Um, and the cool thing is we, that was just published uh, in the spring of this last year. So. One of the cool things that we found, um, if you really want to read it, I'll give you the link. It's very academic and very stats and data driven. Um, so I'm going to try to make this a little more applicable for you, translate this for you. Um, now, one of the things that we found that we weren't actually expecting, but that was pleasantly surprising and I'm most excited about, is that respondents who are more centered, so again, Lower, lower aggregate scores in those areas of being triggered. Um, enjoyed the following benefits. They had 20%, 27% less anxiety when compared with the general population study. They had 26% less stress and 20% less depression. So uh, there's a lot of data out there about um, 
uh, mindfulness and those kinds of practices or centering practices and the health benefits. Um, but we kind of found this without necessarily even directly looking for it. It kind of came up out of the data. So again, um, ways in which living centered has like really concrete applications. Now, my own personal experience and then the research that I've done that has sort of validated this is that one of, I won't say the only, but one of the best ways to live centered <laughs> is through something uh, and Chris talked about this, like mindfulness or meditation or contemplative prayer. Um, I like to use the umbrella term of contemplative practices to capture that range because some people are going to be really drawn to say like a secular mindfulness practice where I'm focusing on the breath to center yourself. Um, but other people, like in my day job, I'm a theologian and an ethicist. Um, so I practice contemplative prayer. That to me is a form of prayer. Um, but the, the basic practices of centering, I've found, I spent a lot of time studying uh, different traditions and different teachers. Um, the core of those practices all has something related to this idea of being centered. So I'm so glad that Chris warmed you up with that because I don't have to just throw that out as like, hey, the weird uh, thing that the theologian's going to talk about in the room. But the other cool thing is that I'm not alone in suggesting this as a profitable practice. Now, one of my favorite books on leadership, and it's probably one of my favorites because it's got data behind it and I'm a geek like that, um, is this book called Leadership Agility by Bill Joyner and Stephen Josephs. Now, what they did is they teamed up over a couple decades, this is a long-term study, they identified 604 leaders. These were business leaders mostly. Um, and they had to meet certain criteria. They were already, this crop was not a crop of the general population. These were already high performing leaders who had results to back it up. And what they did is as they studied, um, they divided it into five levels. And so when they talk about leadership agility, they talk about how you, you can't go from level five to level one. You have to go through each level as you advance. So they give you tips for kind of identifying where you're at and how you move up. Now, I'm gonna only talk about the top two highest performing of those 604, which they call co-creators, which were 4% of their group, or synergists, who were the smallest, most highest performing group, only 1% of their group. Now, this book has nothing to do with meditation. They just happened to find this. In their, in their study, and of course it stood out to me because of my interest. What they found is that among those top 5% of performers, the co-creators, when surveyed, 40% of them said that they had a daily meditation practice of some form. Ten, an additional 10% said semi-regular. So they're like, yeah, I do it, but maybe not every day. The synergists, it goes up even higher. 50%, half of all the highest 1% performing, and another 35% said it semi-regularly. Um, now this was just something that like stood, jumped off the page to me because of my interest. Um, uh, to give some kind of, uh, I guess, social proof, you'd call it, of the effectiveness of why this is important for leadership. Now, the, the other thing I want to mention briefly from Joyner and Josephs is that the main skill that they identify as the ability to move between levels is um, they identified that the benefit of meditation comes from training the attention, the ability to pay attention in the moment. Um, and they call this ability reflective action. They identify that reflective action as a core skill for moving up in leadership agility. And here's how they describe reflective action. They say it's the ability to step back in the moment and attend directly but very briefly to a current assumption, feeling, or behavior that would otherwise escape your attention. So when we talked before about how we skip over that space of freedom because we're not even tuned into it, through some kind of practice like this, contemplative practice, you are actually training your ability to notice those moments, to notice when you're getting triggered and your blood pressure is going up and you're about to say something really stupid to your boss or your spouse or your kid or whoever else. So 
they identified attention. Other studies on meditation have also identified attention as a key skill that's developed in meditation. Now, I put this up because there are studies that have been done that show when a speaker puts up an image of a brain scan on a slide, that the audience members automatically rate them as more intelligent. So <laughs> that's really why I did this. Um, no. Thanks for letting us know. Yeah. <laughs> my brother built my PowerPoint. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> No, oh, the real reason I put it up here, Andrew Newberg is a, uh, a scientist who's done a lot of study of brains under meditation. Now, if you'll notice here in this red area in the front, um, this is during baseline, so somebody just sitting there being told to act natural. And this is during their actual meditation practice, so that you have more neurons firing in this front area of your brain. Going to get nerdy here for a second. Um, this front part of your brain is called your prefrontal cortex, it's the most recent evolutionary development of your brain, of humans' brains, not just yours. I mean, you might think yours is more evolved, but Andrew Newberg can tell you. Um, this is the region of your brain that controls what we call executive function. So uh, logical reasoning, long-term planning, and impulse control are all controlled in this area. So again, when you talk about getting triggered and into making poor decisions, you're, um, you're building up you could literally think of this as like going to the gym, right? And you talked about the importance of like, it shouldn't, like it's good that things aren't super easy when we're building a business. That resistance is good because it builds strength. So that resistance that you find when you sit down to practice and you're like, oh, I suck at this because I have so many thoughts going through my head. You can reframe that and say, well, maybe I'm learning to deal with those thoughts in a healthier way so that I can live more centered. So it's like building a muscle in the gym, right? So you go to the gym, you break down the muscle so that your body rebuilds stronger with more muscle tissue, more muscle fiber. Um, what neuroscientists would call this in a meditation or mindfulness practice, um, they would call this increasing your neuron density. So your neural pathways that connect from here to the moon and back become more dense. And so it's easier for information to flow. Now, why is this important? There's another Fascinating finding. This one is from a guy by the name of Richard Davidson. He's a brain scientist. He's actually a good friend of the Dalai Lama's as well. Um, he's a brain scientist at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. He found that people who engage in long-term mindfulness or meditation or contemplative practice um, have greater neural density in the pathways that connect the prefrontal cortex with the amygdala. So you remember what I said about the amygdala. It's the trigger, right? It sets off the cortisol, narrows your vision. And I said before that your prefrontal cortex is where you make good decisions, calmly, rationally, uh, in line with vision. So literally what Davidson found is that the rational part of your brain is more easily able to say to the little two-year-old screaming in your amygdala, sit down and shut up. <laughs> um, through a regular practice. So these are really powerful ways of applying this. So let's get practical here. Chris gave you some things to take home. I want to do the same. So in my language of living centered, living centered is about responding out of that space of freedom rather than reacting in a way that we are not free. And we tend to react out of our old paradigms and behaviors. Um, and to the extent that those aren't serving us, that's where we need to bring in some new skills and practices to reorient. So three easy things that you could start doing right now, literally. Um, just pausing and tuning in will, also, will already start to train your attention. So you can do this in kind of day-to-day -day life, right? Noticing when, um, I don't know, well, I'll use my, my example of my daughter because we have like polar opposite personalities and she knows how to get under my skin. And she apparently enjoys it. Um, I mean, she probably would say she's not doing it on purpose, but man, it feels like it to me. Um, so if I can notice, like, oh, my blood pressure is rising. Why is she doing that? Okay, she's not trying to make me mad. She's just wow. being her beautiful, fun self. Usually she's like spinning and singing and dancing, and I want her to brush her teeth. But there's a beautiful thing about her spinning and dancing. So I can pause. If I can do that, I start to train that attention skill, that reflective action, because it's in the moment. I can decide, 
how do I want to respond out of freedom versus how am I going to react in those old ways that are not going to help the relationship. Um, and then from there, I can act with more freedom and with more integrity. And when I say freedom and integrity, again, I go back to that idea of acting and doing, making decisions that are aligned with both my personal and then corporate mission and values that I'm committed to. Now imagine for a second how that skill might develop if you took two minutes when you get into your office uh, before opening your email and checking your phone. What if you took two minutes, uh, you didn't skip lunch like Chris uh, suggested, and when you come back from lunch, you take two minutes before you dive back into your, your work. What if you took two minutes before you left your office to go home and be present to whoever's there waiting for you? What if you took two minutes before bed? Just one minute before waking up, or uh, not before, you can't do it before you wake up. If you learn how to meditate and sleep at the same time, then you found more time in your day. Um, right, so there are, there are little ways that you can start to infuse that. Now remember, um, one actually one that I've found that I really like that I've been doing is when I get in my car, I've got an app called Insect Timer. Um, it's free and there's no advertising on it, so I don't mind uh, promoting them. Um, I have it set for two minutes, and when I get in my car, I'll just try to do two minutes of, of breathing, of silence. I have a mantra that I use as well in my practice. Um, so, and that, I mean, it radically changes my day just to take those little breaks. It, so it doesn't have to be long. Now, remember before that kite graph of your CWA results, that's your awareness. Imagine turning that on its side so that what you're looking at here is, this, is a surface level of awareness. When you engage in regular practice, you're gonna start doing what um, Howard Thurman calls centering down. You move in, so as those, say your scores are coming in and you're coming in and down and you're starting to live more from your center through your regular practice, you start to tune into what some teachers would call your inner observer. It's almost like you're watching your life happen like you're sitting at a movie theater. And you're even watching yourself have that stupid reaction or you're watching your coworker have that reaction that drives you crazy. Um, you can actually cultivate that Capacity, and as you do that and kind of center in and down, you're going to find um, greater peace of mind interiorly and happiness. You're also going to start to connect with a greater sense of compassion at, or with a sense of love for all beings. Now, I know that gets a little frou frou, maybe, but every single tradition I've ever studied, including even like the secular mindfulness forms, talk about that ability to connect with others improves when you do this. And we all know, I don't care what business you're in, right? it's all about the relationship that you have with your customer or your client and your employees. So if you're able to tap into that a little bit more um, and let that flow, it's going to start having those positive effects. Now that's the interior side of things. Simultaneous and really, even if you didn't know this theory, this stuff happens naturally when you start doing this reflective action and doing a little more practice. Externally, you're also going to find that your ability to focus is going to come a little bit more naturally and easily. Um, so it's going to be a little bit more efficient and easy to make those good decisions. And you're going to start to find that you're experiencing that alignment between your inner life uh, that will become richer and your external choices and actions. So there's another kind of, um, I guess, benefit. Uh, now, when you're able to do this, Right? When you're able to be more focused, you're also going to have more time to see the big picture, to um, maybe do strategy, to, do, to, to get out of working in your business and instead, of, and instead of working in, move into working on your business. Right? Have more time for that. So all those things that you talked about doing before, I think, are fitting pretty well with here. Um, OK. So the last thing I'll say, a uh, couple things is when you tap into this center and you're living more centered, um, the other thing that starts to happen, is, like I said, it becomes a little more effortless. It's almost like a state of flow where you're allowing what I would call grace, something bigger than you starts to flow through you just naturally, right? Um, 
Now, you might have different words for it, and I'm not going to proselytize anybody. Some people are going to call that God. Some people are going to call it enlightenment. Some people are going to call it the Tao, right? But when you tap into that, you're going to start to have this sense that something bigger is, is actually flowing through you. It's still you acting, but it's going to feel different. So I want to leave you with a challenge. And uh, it's great that Chris gave you some concrete ideas as well. Um, you're going to experience the most benefit of living centered if you have a regular practice. One thing that the research also finds is a lot of times you, people think, you know, I got to wait until I have 45 minutes to sit in silence, and that's the only way it'll work or do any good, or an hour and a half, or whatever. Um, but the research actually shows that it's the regularity of practice is more important than the length. So you are better off taking two minutes at the beginning of your day and two minutes at the end of your day, and maybe two minutes in the middle or somewhere else in there, right? Or even one or five or 10, you decide. Um, you're, you're gonna see more results and you're gonna get more benefits by doing that than if you wait until you get 20 or 30 minutes. Because you know what happens? You're not gonna find the 20 or 30 minutes unless you really set it aside. Now, if you really, really wanna go deep, it's both, right? You have a longer practice, and you commit to it every day. Um, my own practice is, is one called Centering Prayer. Um, and the teaching that I learned in Centering Prayer, the goal, and I say goal, held loosely here, is 20 minutes twice a day. Um, I will say most days I get my morning meditation set in. Afternoon, evening, it gets a little tough. Work, kids, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I'll say this about doing the, a practice. There have been days when I have not done my practice and I've regretted it. There has never been a single day, I can say this with 180% confidence, where I did the practice, where I took the time and I regretted it later. Where I got to the end of the day and said, damn it, I wish I could have sent that email, you know, if I just hadn't meditated. It changes your relationship with time and that's where I think your idea of uh, testing ideas might be uh, one to bring in here. See how your relationship with time changes by just bringing little pockets of tuning in into your day and living more centered. So at the end of the day, you can really see like this, this living centered is more than just success, though obviously I want that for you and for people who do this. Um, but it's really about cultivating a new kind of leadership. Uh, it's about living and working and connecting in both personal and professional life on that creative plane where you're not worried about crushing the competition, right? But you're tuned into your own gifts and your own creativity and that you're really building up people and your community through your business it becomes a medium of that, right? You said, yeah, we all want to make money. Yeah, of course I do too. Um, but that won't keep you going, right? In the, when, when shit gets crazy and it gets really hard. But tapping into that bigger why will, being centered in that way. So my hope is that you have found some inspiration, uh, maybe some practical tips for um, living centered, some things to take home with you, um, with the ultimate goal that, that you're able to tap into that inner core of wisdom that, that you all have and share that with the world. So thank you very much for your time.